Welcome to today's 4-H Quarantine Virtual Science Cafe. I'm Laura Wilson, 4-H Science Professional. I'm really glad you could join us. 4-H is a community for all kids with programs that suit a variety of backgrounds, interests, schedules, in school, after school, clubs to camps, and just remember that our 4-H Camp and Learning Centers right now are registering kids for the summer, so think about that. Um, our positive youth development programs are available in your local community, around the state, and we welcome every kid who wants to have fun, learn, and grow. We are the youth development program of the University of Maine. We're brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Just want to take a minute to introduce um, our 4-H staff who are here on with us today. Here at Maine 4-H, we have Dr. Vanessa Klein. She is our state 4-H STEM specialist. We have Alice Philbrick, who is also with Vanessa monitoring the chat. Christy Ouellette, 4-H educator from the UMaine Cooperative Extension Lisbon office. Uh, we have Jesse Brainerd, who is hosting our Q&A. And we're really happy to have you here. We're gonna keep the session simple. Our guest will share some of his cool science, tell about himself and his pathway to working here at the University of Maine, and we'll have plenty of time for you to ask questions. We'll use the Q&A box. It would either be at the bottom or the top of your screen. And those questions will be monitored by Jesse, and she'll be able to get those to Chef Rob when he's at a point where he can take some questions. So a quick note about our chat feature. I love to see your reactions to what our guest presents, but please keep on topic, keep the language clean and appropriate, and we'll leave that chat feature open for the day. So it is my pleasure right now to introduce Chef Rob. Chef Rob Dumas, would you please tell our participants about yourself and what you do at the University of Maine? Absolutely. Laura, should I go ahead and share my screen? That'd be great. Thank you. All right. All right. Does it look good? Looks very good. good. All right. Very good. So hello, everyone. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend some time with, uh, with UMaine and the 4-H and myself. My name is Rob Dumas. I'm the Food Science Innovation Coordinator and at the University of Maine. And, and part of my job there is I manage a food processing facility called the Dr. Matthew Highlands Pilot Plant. And um, I work for the School of Food and Agriculture, but my appointment is a split appointment. So I work for both the School of Food and Ag and the Office of Innovation and Economic Development. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about what those two kind of um, groups do and what my responsibilities are. So on my first slide here, um, that's a picture of me, though I reali realize you guys can probably see me in the chat box. And then there's a picture of half of the pilot plant and some of my, uh, some of my neat food processing equipment that I've gotten there. And um, I'll go ahead and jump to my next slide here. And um, we'll talk a little bit about my background and how I came to this role at the university. So. I am um, not originally from Maine. I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up right outside of New Orleans. And I, um, from a pretty early age, had a, had a definite passion for food. I, um, I have always been someone who, you know, gets excited about holiday meals, family meals, food traditions, you know, about the first strawberries of the year, or the first tomatoes. And uh, Louisiana's got a very rich culture and heritage around food. And I think it was a great place to kind of incubate that passion in me. I, uh, when I was in high school, I was part of the um, culinary arts program where I got to go to Louisiana Technical College. So I got to go to a tech program and do culinary arts, which was a great experience. And it, it helped me get some better paying positions working in the restaurant industry early on and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. You know, I found that uh, getting to cook for people and getting to cook food was a, was a real thrill. I, um, I enjoyed it. I had uh, a success at it early on. I was, um, had kind of a, you know, a natural um, knack for cooking and um, really fell in love with the, the rush of a busy restaurant, the smells, the sounds, and it was, it was a lot of fun. 
Um, I grew up a uh, military brat. Both of my parents were in the Air Force, and we bounced around a fair amount prior to um, prior to me being born. I was born in Kansas, but lived the majority of my life in Louisiana. And as part of that kind of um, military upbringing, I had a little bit of an inclination to do some military service myself. So another picture that you can see on this slide is a uh, nuclear submarine. And so when I left Louisiana, I left when I was about 20 years old and I joined the Navy and I ended up doing five years on board a uh, fast attack submarine, the USS Oklahoma City. I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen or not, but that guy at the very back of the sub right there, that's actually me. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was part of a, I guess a collateral responsibility that I had on board the submarine was to be the ship's diver. And so whenever we would do a topside operation where we would have um, people on the deck, I would be topside as kind of a, a lifeguard or a safety swimmer. And it was a, kind of a fun responsibility because I got to see some pretty neat parts of the world um, you know, from the, from the deck of a submarine. And this picture is actually taken in Suda Bay, Crete. And uh, Crete is an island off the coast of Greece. And uh, what, a, what a neat place to get to visit as a young man. It was really quite cool. And uh, while I was on board the submarine, I, um, I was a cook and I did quite a bit of cooking. Um, submarines are a really interesting environment to live in and cook in. And one of the neat things that I got to do was become the ship's night baker. And so I actually became a nocturnal person and I uh, would basically get up for work at about 6.30 p.m. and I would go to work until about 7 a.m. And um, it was a pretty interesting job. And one of the neat things about subs is they have a really limited amount of food storage space. So everything that we ate on board the submarine, we pretty much prepared from scratch on board and so you know all of your breads all of your you know desserts and cookies your pies you know none of that stuff came in pre-made in any form we just had raw ingredients and it was uh, really a neat experience and i started to learn a little bit more about the act of uh, making care of people through food when i was on a submarine you know in, in the restaurant industry in new orleans i think i was mostly focused on just making the best food possible and being really good at cooking. And, and I came to realize through the submarine service that food has a, a, a larger role to play than just, you know, being, being tasty or being fancy. Um, but food can be, you know, what brings people together and what gives people um, some degree of, of comfort and family. And it was, uh, it was really a neat experience to get to, to cook for that group of guys on the boat. And um, I enjoyed it a lot. I did, I did well on the submarine and I got the opportunity to interview for a position working at the White House in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And I got there very shortly after um, President Obama took office and I was there for his first term. So from 2000, about is the very end of 2009 to the beginning of, uh, or to 2013. And um, it was a great experience getting to be in the White House, as you can imagine, you know, really top-notch group of individuals that I got to work with, a phenomenal, um, you know, menu and phenomenal access to food. And we got to travel quite a bit too. I got to see a lot of the world um, traveling with the first family and uh, just a remarkable experience. But one of the things that has been in kind of an enduring aspect of my service at the White House was I got involved with something called the American Culinary Federation. And the ACF is a, what you would call a professional organization. And it's the certifying body for chefs in the United States. Um, when you see a chef that is a certified executive chef or a certified master chef or something like that, for them to earn that certification, they've got to go through some degree of, uh, of testing to determine that they have met the standards that that organization has established for that. And when I started at the White House, I initially got certified at the chef de cuisine level. And so that would be your kind of leader in an organization or in a kitchen. And then I decided that I wanted to pursue a higher level of certification. And I, I took the certification practical for a certified executive chef. And that was a, a really neat process. It's, it's kind of a three-part um, evaluation. The first part is they would evaluate your 
experience and to ensure that you've got the management and leadership experience necessary to attain that. Then they would want to do a practical exam. And in the practical exam, you have a reality cooking TV show or something. You have a mystery basket of ingredients and you have to prepare those ingredients and you have to produce a certain number of dishes. And with those dishes, you have to have a certain number of sauces and a certain number of classical um, cuts, which would be a classical cut would be a small dice, a large dice, a brunoise, a julienne. So there are specific measurements that you produce with a cut vegetable. And it was, um, you know, it's a, it's a good reinforcement of the foundation of cooking. And, uh, you know, consistency in, in your knife work is really key to good cooking outcomes. And um, either way, I really enjoyed my time getting introduced to the ACF when I was in DC. And I have um, continued that relationship. Now here in Maine, I'm the president of the Down East chapter which represents chefs and culinarians from Augusta North and East. And uh, we've got a, a really good chapter. We've got about 40 chefs and um, we, we've got some good momentum around education and community service activities. And uh, we have several younger chefs who are interested in certification. So we're excited to be able to help those chefs achieve their kind of personal and professional goals um, in getting their ACF certification as well. And, you know, you might ask, why would you even pursue certification? But um, certification gives you some credibility. It, it allows an employer to look at that certification and say, well, this person's been independently kind of assessed by another organization. I can, I can trust that they're going to be a good hire or a good asset in my organization. So I would like to think that um, the time I invested in getting my certifications has, um, has paid me back and opening some doors for me. So um, the last little bucket that I have on here is relevant because you might wonder why a guy from Louisiana uh, who you know, went to Virginia and DC ended up in Maine. And um, so I met my wife when I was on the submarine and I was actually stationed in Southern Maine in Kittery at the uh, shipyard. And when we left the shipyard, I went down to DC. And then from DC, I left and I came up to Vermont and I actually lived in Montpelier. Uh, for about four years. And I noticed there are several Vermonters in the chat room. So um, pretty cool to see that we're getting some of our neighbors from around New England in the uh, quarantine cafe today. But either way, I got to um, spend about four years in Montpelier. I did a program with the New England Culinary Institute where I was the school's fellow. And so I was a educator, but I was also finishing my degree. Um, when I completed my degree, I transitioned from being the school's fellow to being a, uh, a chef instructor. And I got the opportunity to teach a variety of uh, culinary arts courses. And um, I also got to travel for the school as a school's demonstration chef. And uh, that was a really neat opportunity. I, I really enjoyed getting to uh, cook and um, show off kind of what Necky was all about to other tech centers throughout Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. It was. Uh, Pretty cool job and I, I really liked it. So um, from Necky, I ended up up here in Maine and uh, here in Maine, I will um, kind of talk a little bit about what my job is here in my next slide. So I'll move on to that. Oh, but I do have a poll question. So my number one poll question here is what kind of foodie are you? And so are you the type of person that loves to cook, loves to eat, or loves to both cook and eat. So I'm definitely uh, love to both cook and eat, but I'd be curious to understand what each of you are and uh, what bucket you fall into. So I will um, give you guys a couple minutes to respond to the poll question and um, we'll and move ahead. Rob, this is Jesse. I was thinking while folks are answering that, we did have a question come in going okay. back to um, when you were a night baker. The question is, why did you cook and bake during the night? Was there some importance to it? So the reason that a lot of the baking production happened at night on the submarine was that operationally, there was a little bit less going on um, during the two kind of day shifts. Um, so a submarine is broken into three watch sections. And um, the, the night watch section typically had a little bit less going on 
and the meals were a little bit simpler to prepare. So um, lunch and dinner were a fairly, you know, complete meal with, with um, you know, a primary protein, sometimes an alternative protein, a starch, two vegetables, a sauce, soup, you know, baked good, um, you know, dessert, bread, all of that kind of thing. So there would be quite a lot to do for lunch and dinner. Uh, we would feed a midnight meal on the submarine and that midnight meal we called mid rats. And that was a pretty easy meal to prepare. A lot of times it was things like, uh, you know, chicken nuggets or uh, tuna noodle casserole or turkey tetrazzini or uh, maybe grilled ham and cheese, things like that, like nothing overly kind of fussy or difficult. And a lot of times it was also an opportunity for us to use any leftovers that we might have had during the day. So, you know, if we served uh, uh, roast pork loin or something for lunch, I might take that pork loin for dinner or for mid rats and slice it up really thin and make some, um, you know, like pork paninis, like a Cubano or something like that. Um, but it gave a little bit more time to do that production at night. And um, it was just a little bit quieter. Plus, um, you know, breakfast is a great time to have a fresh pastry. So we would make, you know, homemade cinnamon rolls and donuts and things like that on the night shift as well. And we have, uh, yep, we have a follow-up question. Uh, was the sub military or just for research? Uh, nope, it was, a, it was a military submarine. So it was part of the U.S. Navy, and it was um, a fast attack submarine. It's the USS Oklahoma City, SSN 723. Um, it's still an active submarine today. It's actually stationed in Guam, of all places now. I, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like maybe I got gypped a little bit that I didn't get to live in a, a tropical... Uh, you know, subtropical country, but uh, but Soviet Virginia wasn't so bad either. <laughs> and we do have our poll question um, results up. A lot of people like to both cook and to eat. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good that we've got some uh, some some cookers and some eaters here because that's that's the bucket I fall into too. I like to pick on my wife. She loves food, but she really only likes to eat it. She's not a big fan of cooking it. So I think uh, we were a good match there, but. Either way, so I will, um, I'll move on a little bit here to, um, to my next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about what it is I do at UMaine. So I'm the Food Science Innovation Coordinator, and, and some of you guys may be asking, you know, the same question that I had when I read that. I was like, what in the world does that even mean? Um, but basically what it means is that I get paid to play with food, and um, it's a pretty cool job. So the primary organization that I work for at UMaine is this uh, the School of Food and Agriculture. And the School of Food and Agriculture has a responsibility to educate young people in the realm of um, food science and nutrition, as well as some other um, areas relative to um, horticulture, raising animals, pre-vet stuff. But the, the principal kind of responsibility that I have to the School of Food and Ag is managing the Dr. Matthew Highlands pilot plant. And what that means is that I've got this really neat lab that's completely full of food processing equipment and all kinds of interesting things from freeze dryers to conveyor steamers to um, I've got a giant smokehouse that I can smoke 600 pounds of meat at a time in. Um, we've got cheese making equipment. We've got some uh, pasta extruders. We've got a big twin screw extruder. So a lot of neat food preparation equipment. And that equipment has a couple of purposes. So uh, a lot of it is there to facilitate research. And that research might be something where, you know, your PI is um, Dr. Perry or Dr. Sconberg, you know, your, your, your um, faculty member that is, in, that is your teacher. But you as a grad student would probably be the one actually carrying out the day-to-day -day research in the plant. So a lot of times I'm there to help the grad students with operating the equipment correctly and safely, um, you know, to make sure that we're doing things in accordance with, with good um, hygienic practices, as well as some of this equipment can be dangerous. Um, so it's important that the kids, that the students understand the appropriate standard operating procedures. So you might hear a term called an SOP. And so I manage all of the equipment and the SOPs as well as the, um, the hygiene plan for the pilot plant. But there's a lot of opportunity beyond just serving the needs of the students with the pilot plant. And what I get to do is I get to leverage that facility and that equipment to fulfill what's called the land grant mission. 
um, of UMaine. And so UMaine is a land grant school. And what that means in a nutshell is that we have an obligation to the state of Maine that we provide expertise and resources to bolster Maine's economy, to provide economic opportunity and to provide resources to businesses in Maine. And so a lot of the interesting equipment that I have are things that Maine producers could benefit from understanding if it would be a good fit in their facility and or some Maine producers don't have an R&D facility where they can do benchtop runs of new products. You know, when they build their facility to make their product, they purpose build their facility to just simply make that one product and they don't necessarily have a test kitchen or a secondary um, food manufacturing space where they can do a prototype run of something. And so the pilot plant gets to be a resource to producers in the state and I get to be a resource to them in extending my expertise in food preparation and, and food science and helping them to develop new food products, which I'll talk a little bit more about in, my, uh, in a couple slides forward. But um, below are a few pictures of some of the neat things that we've been doing in the plant. Um, and I guess one other thing worth mentioning is I get to use the plant also as an extension of um, the UMaine Cooperative Extension. And so Cooperative Extension exists to kind of fulfill that land grant mission as well. And I get to host workshops within the pilot plant where we bring in groups of either professionals or hobbyists to do trainings on some different activities. So the, the barbecue or smoked chicken that you see in the last picture, that was a fun collaboration between myself and the state livestock extension specialist. So Colt Knight, he's a, he's a good old boy from West Virginia and uh, he loves to barbecue. And we, uh, we put together a really fun um, smoking workshop where we had um, a good number of folks. I think we had 18 people come in and we had a, a great three or four hour workshop and um, we smoked a bunch of different meats and talked about the science of smoking and had some really good results with that. The picture in the middle is, is um, the very beginning of some cheese. And so I think this is kind of neat because there's a little bit of a story behind it. So um, Dr. Calder, who um, manages the food testing lab, Dr. Calder connected with me and a cheese producer uh, from Maka named Alva. And Alva is interested in scaling up his production. And he wanted to come in and do some large scale batches of cheese using our cheese making equipment. And so I actually got to go over to Witter Farm, which is UMaine's dairy herd. And I got to meet all the cows one morning early. I got a bunch of milk and I came back and Beth and Alva and I, we made a, a big huge batch of uh, Monterey Jack cheese uh, we did 120 gallons of milk, so quite a bit of milk went into the kettle. And this block, or the picture that you see, is a block of cheese curds prior to being pressed. So in the background of the picture, you can see kind of an interesting looking white bucket with a lid on it. And so this goes inside of that bucket, and then the lid goes on, and then you apply um, a little bit of weight to the top of that. And that weight allows you to press out the remaining whey within the cheese. And af after you get the whey pressed out, the cheese has to age. And that's the, that's the really challenging thing about cheese making is you make it, but then you got to wait a really long time before you get to taste it. Uh, for this particular cheese, we had to wait two months uh, before we could taste it, which was really, uh, was really uh, trying my patience there. Um, I like to, I've always, you know, been able to eat the things that I cook relatively quickly. So waiting two months was, was quite a bit of a challenge. And then the first picture is um, something called aquafaba. And so aquafaba is using the starchy liquid from chickpeas in order to make a stable foam. And aquafaba is used a lot of times as a substitute for meringue, and meringue would be whipped egg whites. So kind of a neat thing to um, be able to produce a plant-based version of meringue. So I will open it up for any questions that you guys might have, and then I'll put my second uh, poll question out there. We uh, do have one question going back to the submarine. Okay. Um, what, what did you study on the submarine? Um, so in terms of studying on a submarine, so submarines are a pretty intense environment from the perspective of safety. And so my principal focus while I was on the submarine was, um, was learning the submarine's operating systems 
and um, understanding all of the damage control aspects of the submarine. And so what that means is, um, you know, when a submarine is underwater, it's a, it's a self-supporting, um, you know, city in and of itself. It makes its own water, it makes its own air, it has all of its own, um, you know, trash disposal, everything happens on board that submarine. And it's also kind of a, a scary place in that if you let the outside in, you know, it can kill you. So a lot of the focus within my first year on the submarine was around getting, um, getting my dolphins or getting sub-qualified. Uh, following that, I did take online college in hospitality and restaurant management. Uh, we were able to get courses ahead of time. But, um, you know, I think the, the real lasting impression or impact that my service on the submarine made on me was um, the, the connection between food and people and, and how uh, nourishing and how kind of central food can become to life. And, um, and I think that was the, the biggest kind of educational element of my time on the sub. Um, you know, I, I realized the, the real, you know, depth or power that food has, um, you know, in terms of the way it affects people's lives. And so if you yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, we actually have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, uh, we have two questions about cheese. One is, what is the most aged cheese that is able to be made? And then, what is your favorite type of cheese to make? Okay, those are two great questions. So, um, in terms of the most aged cheeses, so probably some of the oldest cheeses that you'll come, ac uh, come across will be some of the Italian um, cheeses like Grana Padano, or um, there are some really aged pecorinos, and there are some really aged uh, parmesans. Um, but actually, there's some there's some neat American cheese that's being aged some really long times as well. The um, there's a cheese producer in um, Greensboro, Vermont, called um, Sellers at Jasper Hill, and Sellers at Jasper Hill has partnered with Cabot, and they are doing a cheese called Cabot Clothbound which they're aging a wheel of cheddar for one year in their cheese cave. And I got the opportunity when I was working for Necky to take students on a field trip there. And we got to taste cheeses at various different ages. And they had cloth bound there that they weren't producing necessarily for sale, but just for, um, you know, maybe for experimentation that they had, they had aged in their cellar for four years. And so I got to eat some of a four year old, um, cheddar cheese, which was was really neat. It, it had gotten a really almost crunchy crystalline texture to it. And um, it was delicious. I, I, I really, really liked it. Um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't eat it every day. Um, but it was a, a neat, a neat thing to taste. And then in terms of my favorite cheeses to make personally, I, um, I really enjoy making uh, ricotta. So it's a uh, ricotta is and this probably, um, you know, tells a story about how impatient I am. <laughs> Uh, ricotta is a really fast cheese to make. You could actually make ricotta at home while you're on quarantine. Um, it's, it's a very simple cheese. It's, you simply heat and acidulate some milk and that separates the curd from the whey and then you strain it and you have a soft cheese. And that soft cheese can be eaten as is or you can fill pasta with it. You can sweeten it and fill things like cannoli and things like that. It's um, it's a very tasty cheese. You can also further drain the ricotta and you can add things like herbs and salt and spices and make something called ricotta salata. And that's a crumbly cheese similar to a, um, a feta or a uh, maybe a queso fresco, um, but really a fun and easy cheese to make. And I would encourage you guys to, you know, if you're looking for a fun cheese making experiment to do at home, try out a ricotta. Okay, one more quick cheese question, then I'm going to hold the next questions until the next break, but this goes with it. What is your favorite kind of cheese to use? Favorite cheese to use? Um, you know, I think, I think you got to pair the right cheese to the right application. Um, probably the cheese that I eat the most is, is a cheddar cheese, um, just because it's, uh, you know, economical. There are some very good ones, you know, readily available. But, um, you know, depending on what I'm cooking, I, you know, I do really enjoy goat cheese. Um, I, re I like Chev, um, so it's a soft cheese. It goes really well on salads, pizzas, and sandwiches, things like that. Um, but, 
you know, I, I, I'm never without Parmesan. I'm never without Pecorino. And um, I always have some blue cheese around too, because there are, you know, some things that a good uh, gorgonzola, um, you know, or a good domestic blue just can't be beat. And so, you know, I guess the short answer would be cheddar is probably the, the cheese that if I could only have one cheese for the rest of my life, it would be cheddar cheese. But um, I, um, you know, and obviously you can't make a good pizza without some mozzarella and provolone. So, you know, I, I don't know that I could live without pizza either. So that's a, that's a good, good question to ponder there. And our poll results are in too. And yeah. everybody thinks that science can help you make better tasting food. Well, that's good. I'm very glad that people feel that way because it is absolutely true that every day when you're cooking, are essentially doing a science experiment in your own kitchen. And you even get to try it out on real living people. I mean, we have to go through a whole board before we can uh, allow real living people to, to you know, have science experiments performed on them. But uh, you get to do it every day when you cook some food. So that's good that you understand that. Um, very good. So we'll move on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about that kind of land grant mission at UMaine and a little bit more about um, what I do in terms of product development. So poll question number three, and I think you've got a, uh, some choice here where you can choose some of the foods that apply. But what I want to understand is what are some of the iconic foods that are produced in Maine? And some of these will be pretty easy, um, but I'll be curious to see if, um, you know, how many people get the kind of wildcard ones that I've slipped in there as well. So we'll give it a minute or so to let people answer the poll. And most people have responded. I'm gonna give people about 10 more seconds to finish making their choices. Okay, perfect. All right. There and we go. also have um, a response in the chat box because we have a group of students sitting together who say potatoes, lobster, and apples. Well, these answers are spot on. Um, so it looks like our leading one is lobsters, followed by blueberries, followed by potatoes, and then some dairy and cran. I'm glad to see a lot of people said cranberries. And the Vermonters must be thinking, no, we're number one at maple syrup, not you Mainers. <laughs> um, but awesome. Well, very good. So a few of the iconic foods and I'll kind of, um, I've got a few pictures here to kind of add to it. So obviously potatoes, uh, wild blueberries, and any of you down Easters, so folks that grew up in um, kind of mid coast or coastal Maine, you'll recognize this uh, diabolical tool here called the blueberry rake and um, some fresh lobsters some apples, some good old cows for that good dairy, maple syrup, and cranberries. And so the reason I wanted to share this slide is because a lot of the work that I do to support producers in Maine are focused around these foods. And um, in addition to these foods, one of the emerging kind of markets or emerging products in Maine are a lot of the um, aquaculture products. And so seaweeds and other sea vegetables as well as um, mollusks and bivalves, so oysters and clams, and there's um, scallops and uh, things like that are, are also um, have more and more interest from a aquaculture or a farming of the ocean or the coast. So kind of a neat opportunity. So pretty cool little market basket that I get to play with every day or get to think about how I can kind of serve these industries. And so one of the relationships that I wanna talk about a little bit is um, Wyman's of Maine. So many of you guys that shop at the 
your local Hannaford or Shaw's probably see Wyman's products at the grocery store. And, and Wyman's is a, um, a larger player in the wild blueberry market here in Maine. Um, they're one of the largest frozen fruit distributors in the country. And um, they have their headquarters in Millbridge, Maine, which is a tiny little town um, up in coastal Maine. And their kind of corporate offices are down in Portland. Well, I met with some of the team from Wyman's and I gave them a tour of the pilot plant and talked to them a little bit about some of the capacity that I had there to do some, some contract work for them. And it has turned out to be a really strong relationship. And I've been doing quite a few different projects for Wyman's and that product development work is really a lot of fun. It's allowed me to transition from being kind of a, a production chef where I'm cooking for you know, people and then feeding them that food immediately to now I am developing food products that will then get um, produced and distributed throughout the country. And so the, one of the, I guess, exciting opportunities there is that Maine wild blueberries have had a challenging time competing with cultivated blue high bush blueberries. So uh, when someone says a Maine wild blueberry, it's, it's very different than what you might see if you went to a farm and you picked blueberries off of a big tall bush. So Maine wild blueberries are a what's called a low bush blueberry and they, they don't grow very tall. They're maybe only a foot off the ground or so and that's a, that's a relatively tall blueberry plant. They're probably more like six to eight inches off the ground. And that's why I mentioned in the previous slide the rake um, when people used to hand harvest blueberries, they would go around bent over in a field, raking them up. Um, that entire industry has shrunken quite a bit in recent years due to competition from cultivated berries throughout the world. You know, you could go to, you know, Walmart or your grocery store and probably buy blueberries about every month of the year because they're grown all throughout the different countries and hemispheres. Um, those cultivated blueberries uh, certainly are not as delicious or nutritious as wild blueberries. And there's an exciting opportunity here in Maine to create what's called a value added product with wild blueberries. Um, typically what you're going to see for wild blueberries available to consumers in Maine is frozen blueberries. And it's up to the consumer to kind of make what they will with it. There are some folks doing blueberry jams, blueberry jellies and things like that but they're not really being used as the principal ingredient in any kind of a value added food product. So in working, for, in working with Wyman's, I'm working to develop new food products featuring wild blueberries in an appreciable quantity. And it's really, it's a very exciting work. And um, obviously getting to work with blueberries all the time is, is also very delicious. You know, it's much better than working with, uh, I don't know, anchovies or something, <laughs> but um Pretty cool opportunity. In the pictures below, you'll see kind of what my day-to-day -day kind of productivity in the plant looks like. Everything has to get measured out precisely. Everything's measured to the gram, um, which I will share with all of you if any of you are aspiring um, cooks or if any of you have a desire to get it, be better at cooking than you are. I would encourage you to start measuring things by weight. Um, use grams. It's, it's the easiest to scale up a recipe. So if you want to make half as much or twice as much of the original recipe. Um, the math is super easy when you do things by weight and not by volume. And, and as another kind of fun exercise, I would encourage you and your family to each scoop one cup of flour and then each of you weigh your one cup of flour and you'll be blown away by how dramatically different the weight is by using a volumetric measure rather than assigning a specific weight and filling to that weight each time. Um, so anyways, that was a bit of a tangent, but um, a lot of my work is, is around producing repl repl results. And so everything's gotta be measured very precisely. And then I have to test lots and lots of different variables. So I've probably made 150 batches of granola and 75 different frozen fillings and I guess I should explain a little bit why. So one of the products that we're working on for Wyman's is a, um, is a handheld blueberry yogurt parfait. And so the idea is that it's a Greek yogurt and blueberries and granola, but instead of having to eat it with a spoon, you can eat it handheld, um, which is kind of neat. And um, we've got a really good 
final prototype of that. It's got a lot of fresh fruit in it. Um, it has very little added sugar, a lot of protein, a lot of fiber. So it, it is certainly uh, a much better choice for you from a health perspective when you compare it to an ice cream sandwich or something like that. And, um, you know, I guess my question for you is, would you be willing to eat a, uh, an ice cream sandwich or a frozen sandwich for breakfast? It's a little bit of a challenge conceptually, but I think it has some potential to exist within that um, kind of category as well. But either way, lots and lots of um, making the same thing over and over again with one or two changes at a time. It's really um, I guess before I move on from um, product development, I'd like to ask if anybody has any questions at this point. We do have a question, and I'm not sure. I believe it was about the acidul acidulation. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, but so, just if you could explain that. Sure. So uh, that was going back to talking about making uh, ricotta. Um, so ricotta can be made with a variety of different um, with a variety of different ingredients. Um, so it's always going to have milk because you got to have something to. Um, you know, you can't make cheese without milk. But then in terms of a acidulating agent, so the idea is to lower the pH of that milk. And when you lower the pH, you're going to separate the, um, basically the milk fats and proteins from the water. And um, so that's separating the curds and the whey. And to lower the pH, or uh, um, a lot of times you're using either lemon juice or vinegar or citric acid, um, whereas in a, a traditional kind of cheese, maybe a Monterey Jack or a cheddar or something like that, you would be using something um, called a, uh, a rennet. And rennet's an enzyme that lowers pH, as well as you would be using a cheese making culture. And so that culture is a, um, an isolated group of bacteria, typically isolated in a laboratory, when you add that to your milk and you heat it to a certain temperature, that, that population of bacteria multiplies and it lowers the pH of the milk. So when, uh, when you lower pH, that's when you're talking about something becoming more acidic or acidulation. So um, pH is on a scale of zero to 14 with seven being neutral and 14 being um, alkaline and zero being acidic. And so with cheese, a lot of times you're trying to get down to like four, eight or um, five, two, something like that. It, 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 it varies based on the cheese. Um, but in terms of the question for ricotta, you, if you've got vinegar or you've got lemon, you could separate your curd from your milk and make a ricotta. So probably a long winded answer for your question there. And we have another question. Do you do any research on plant-based dairy alternatives for those who cannot consume dairy? Absolutely. And so, so that's a great question. And that was a big challenge in making this, um, this yogurt parfait type thing is trying to make a, um, trying to make a vegan version. And I'll, I'll just use the word vegan because um, I guess uh, to, to give a little bit of explanation, vegan would mean that you would consume something that contains no animal products. And so if you wanted to make a plant-based or a lactose-free version, um, you would need to go in a, uh, you know, you could also call it a vegan product. Now, the trick that I, or the challenge that I ran into with making the, the yogurt um, sandwich or the smoothie sandwich vegan was um, a lot of the plant-based milk alternatives or yogurt alternatives um, rely on um, colloids or, or uh, I guess, gelling agents to thicken a largely water-based um, kind of, um, I guess, coconut milk or things like that are largely water-based. And so uh, to take that and make it frozen and still have it be something that you can bite through while it's frozen is very hard to do. Um, you know, with, with the, I can't give you all of my secrets on my, my smoothie sandwich, but with that, I was able to get around the need for, um, that texture by incorporating some air into it in kind of a novel way. Um, so in ice cream, they have this thing called overrun, and it's where you incorporate air in during the freezing process. 
um, I did a kind of a novel approach to creating overrun in making a frozen yogurt um, with that product. It did not work the same when I switched to a non-dairy version. I did, however, make a coconut filling that was delicious, but it required a ton of sugar, and that sugar has a um, water holding capacity, so it ties up some of the available moisture in that mixture and allowed it to freeze in a way that it wasn't rock solid. You know, we don't want people to break a tooth when they go to bite through it, um, but, um, but Wyman's is opposed to having a sugary offering. They want um, health to be at the center of their kind of product and their brand. And so we've got some more work to do before we, we release a, um, a vegan or a plant-based version, but it's, it's definitely in the works and it's been, a, uh, it's been a very fun and challenging project. So that's a great question. All right, very good. I will move on to the next slide here. And um, that's actually a good uh, transition to talking a little bit about emulsions. And so I will kind of ask this as an open-ended question here, and it's what is an emulsion? Um, some of you may have heard that term before, and some of you may have no clue what we're talking about, but I will give you the definition of an emulsion. So an emulsion is a mixture of two fluids such as oil and water that is achieved by breaking up the molecules in both substances into very fine small droplets in order to keep the combination from separating. So I have a question for all of you. Who thinks they've eaten an emulsified food? And I'll give you guys a minute to answer that. While they're answering that, um, we have the question, is stevia not an option for your, for your bars? Um, stevia and other sugar alcohols or sugar alternatives like that are something to explore. Um, they do not have the same uh, chemical properties as sugar. They don't tie up water. Um, so uh, sugar is, is hydrophobic, so you can... Um, that's why when you mix a bunch of sugar and berries together to make a jam or a jelly, it becomes shelf stable. It removes the water activity and kind of ties that up. Or if you were to mix a ton of sugar with a fruit juice and freeze it, you would get a uh, granita or like an Italian ice. Um, sugar has a way of getting in the way of those water molecules from freezing together. And that those things like stevia and monk fruit and things like that, while they may provide the, the sensation or the flavor of sweetness, they don't respond in the same way chemically that good old sugar does. So I have experimented a little bit, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't help me accomplish the textural outcomes that I'm looking for um, like, a, uh, like sugar does. Um, then there are some other gelling agents that, that can also kind of tie up some water activity, things like xanthan gum um, and other hydrocolloids. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's finding the right kind of balance to get the texture that you want as well as the flavor that you want. And I, um, I'm not opposed to using a sugar substitute, but um, they haven't given me the performance characteristics that I've been looking for. Almost everybody has voted in the poll. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down and share the results. All right, so more people have eaten and a good number says that they, they don't know. So that's pretty good. I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that there are quite a few people who are pretty confident that they've eaten an emulsified food. I, um, and I'm also happy to see that there are some that would say that they don't know. So that's good. So let's talk about some examples of emulsified food. Mayonnaise is probably the most classic example of an emulsification. Salad dressings, ice cream, hollandaise. So hollandaise is a warm butter sauce. Um, you might be familiar with it from Eggs Benedict or things like that. Hot dogs are an emulsion. I know it sounds kind of weird to think about something like a, a meat product as an emulsion, but it is um, something that's mixed until a homogenous mixture is formed and you are suspending the, um, the fat throughout that in a way that gives it a really nice kind of soft texture. Uh, bologna is an emulsification. 
And most, uh, not, not all, but some sausages are also an emulsification. And then milk, which I imagine everybody has probably had some sort of milk at some point or another. But I would bet that every single person that's on this webinar today has eaten an emulsified food. And there's my favorite version of it. And then there's an actual picture of me getting super excited about eating a mountain of hot dogs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I do, I do really like uh, emulsified foods. And I will talk a little bit more about emulsions in my next slide. So how to make an emulsion? Because I guess anytime we're talking about food, I want to understand how to make it so I can eat it. But there are a few things to understand about emulsions. So typically in food, you've got three phases or three types of emulsions. You have a temporary emulsion, and an example of that would be a vinaigrette. You have a semi-permanent, which would be something like a honey mustard vinaigrette or an herb pesto or something like that. And then a permanent emulsion would be something like a mayonnaise. And so I'll talk briefly about the differences between these as it relates to an emulsion and what the kind of principal ingredients are that make that difference. So a temporary emulsion, like a vinaigrette, is where you are trying to mix together an oil phase and a water phase. And so in a vinaigrette, the water phase is a fruit juice or a vinegar, and you are trying to suspend throughout that aqueous phase or the liquid phase, the fat. And you're doing that with only one thing to accomplish that, and that is called shear force. And that shear force is you with a whisk or a spatula or um, a whisk or a fork in your hand, stirring vigorously as those two ingredients are colliding with each other. And you are able to disperse small droplets of that oil throughout the aqueous phase, throughout the vinegar. Now, without the aid of an emulsifying agent, um, that will ultimately separate and the oil will coalesce or recollect and it will sit on top of it. Now, in the case of a semi-permanent emulsion, you are introducing something that in food I like to call the bridge, and it is a, another ingredient that is going to help keep that oil phase dispersed throughout the aqueous phase. So um, mustard is a great example of a bridge ingredient. Honey is also a good bridge ingredient in that it helps prevent that oil and water from separating. It helps hold them in their two phases. But without a true emulsifier, um, it is also a semi-permanent emulsion and can break. Now, while you have that bridge ingredient, you still rely upon that shear force to separate those two phases or to incorporate those two phases. So um, a semi-permanent has the addition of the bridge. And in this example, it would be the honey and the mustard. But in the case of a pesto, it might be the vegetative matter, the, um, the nuts or the actual herb that you are blending up with the oil and um, creating that nice creamy pesto or vinaigrette. And then the final one here is a permanent emulsion. And so why is mayonnaise permanent? And the answer lies in the egg yolk. And the egg yolk has an, an ingredient in it called lecithin. And the lecithin is going to act as an emulsifier. And that emulsifier is going to create a more stable emulsion where it's going to permanently hold the two phases together. And so you don't end up with the oil separating out of your um, egg and a mayonnaise. And um, it's a pretty cool thing to try and a pretty cool thing to see. And I will jump to my next slide here. Uh-oh, I, I messed up and I gave you guys the answer to um, poll question five, but we'll go ahead and throw it up there anyways, if you want to, Laura. So let's ask poll question five.
I'm going to give people about 10 more seconds. We're up over 80% of the people have responded already. They're quick. Good, good, good. All right, very good. So many of you got this right, and you are correct that it is an emulsifier that is going to make an emulsification more stable or permanent. And the idea there is that you're holding the oil and water phases um, dispersed. You're dispersing that oil throughout the aqueous phase. And then what's going to hold it in that dispersion is that emulsifier. So that's, um, that's good that you guys notice that. And there are many emulsifiers out there, but the most common would be your egg yolk um, in your mayonnaise example there. And so for my last slide, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to try a little science experiment at home and make a temporary, a semi-permanent, and a permanent emulsion in your very own kitchen. So you can kind of see what those look like and understand the characteristics and properties of each. And then you can taste them and eat them. And you can even have your family be guinea pigs and try out your, um, your science experiments on them. So for the temporary, I have a maple balsamic vinaigrette. And so you'll, the typical ratio for a vinaigrette is one to three parts. Uh, so one part of your water phase to three parts of your oil phase. So you've only got a couple of tablespoons um, here. You've got vinegar. I prefer balsamic vinegar, but you could do it with a maple, uh, an apple cider vinegar, a little bit of maple syrup, salt and pepper. And then you're going to add your olive oil in. And again, you're going to rely on that shear force using a whisk to suspend that oil throughout your aqueous phase. Um, in the semi-permanent, you're going to do a little bit different. We're going to make a honey mustard vinaigrette. And so you'll have honey, Dijon mustard, cider vinegar, and olive oil. And again, you're going to whisk together your honey, your mustard, and your vinegar. And then you will drizzle in your oil. And what I would encourage you guys to do when you make them is pour them into a glass container, something like a mason jar, and then watch and see how long your different phases hold um, and or how long it takes for them to break. And then the final uh, one here is a permanent, and this is to make a mayonnaise. And so you would use one egg yolk, you would use Dijon mustard, lemon juice, vegetable oil, a very small amount of garlic powder, and salt to taste. And so for this, you would combine your egg, your Dijon and lemon in a bowl. You would whisk together and then drizzle your oil in while whisking. Now, it is important with all of these emulsions that you drizzle in the oil. You want to um, not overwhelm your emulsion with too much oil too quickly uh, because it will break your emulsion and you'll end up with the two phases falling out or separating and you'll end up with a kind of unappealing looking um, mayonnaise. You know, you want mayonnaise to be creamy and spreadable, not this kind of broken soupy looking thing. But I will share with you, if you do break your mayonnaise um, because you've added your oil too quickly, you can start a new emulsion in another bowl and then add your broken mayonnaise to that and it will re-emulsify. Um, and what I mean by starting a new emulsion is start with another egg yolk uh, with a little bit of mustard and lemon and a little bit of oil get it started and it should start to look creamy and then add your other mayonnaise into that and you won't have to throw away any ingredients. Now I will give you one caveat here because I feel um, I should be a responsible person. Eating raw eggs is not um, a good idea if you're immunocompromised or if you've got anyone in your family that's immunocompromised. I wouldn't feed that to them um, but you can get pasteurized liquid egg yolks or liquid eggs, and you can use that, or you can pasteurize an egg yolk yourself by soft boiling the egg and separating out the yolk. But, um, you know, I don't know. I've eaten a million mayonnaises with raw eggs in them, and it won't kill you, I promise you. But um, as a good safety kind of dis disclosure there, a caveat, I should mention that. But anyways, that's my um, presentation for today. I've used up an hour of all of your lives. I hope that it has enriched you in some way and um, I'd be happy to take any final questions. Okay, we have the question uh, going back. What is your favorite blueberry product that you've made? 
Hmm. You know, so my favorite blueberry product is something called a uh, blueberry gastrique. And so a blueberry gastrique is a combination of uh, blueberries, vinegar, wine, and sugar. And um, what's neat about it is you make this kind of um, sweet and savory or sweet and sour kind of uh, blueberry sauce. And it's very good over things like roasted poultry. So like making a roast turkey or a roast duck. Um, it's also very good over grilled pork and um, I, I like it. It's also equally good served over ice cream or something like that. And it's, uh, it's a neat old French recipe. I, I did a presentation at the Wild Blueberry Conference in Bangor and um, got a, a lot of people, I think, pretty excited about gastrique. But that would be probably my favorite of uh, the Wild Blueberry things. And we have one more question, which says in the question itself that it's a pretty silly question. This is going back to the submarine. Yeah. And the asker says, you don't have to answer, but it's really bugging them. In the submarine, did you ever start humming Yellow Submarine by the Beatles? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I got all kinds of loopy on the submarine. At one point, we went 89 days um, without leaving the ship. So we were underwater for 89 days straight. And um, I'll tell you, I went a little bit, I went a little bit crazy, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but ultimately, you know, I recovered. But yeah, it's uh, you, definitely, definitely some good old, some good music. And definitely the Beatles were part of my uh, musical repertoire during my submarine time, for sure. So thank you so much for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've told everybody in the chat that we will share your emulsion recipes with them. I can send them out via email and that would be absolutely um, something that we will do because I have everybody's email address, everybody who registered. And let's see, I'm gonna throw one more slide up here just so everybody has our website i want to thank everybody for coming out today i want you to be able to have this website because you might want to learn about more 4-h opportunities in maine and our learn at home website not only has our upcoming 4-h quarantine science cafes but it also has a link to the university of vermont's quarantine 4-h science cafes they will um they offer theirs on wednesdays and everybody is welcome to join them as well just a quick note about next week so chef rob mentioned colt knight as the barbecue guy he is also really into using technology in agriculture so if you have some interest in new and innovative ways of using technology tune in next week i bet he'll answer questions not only about technology but about barbecue because he's that kind of guy we'd love to see you here again next week and that's what we have for you today i just want to thank everybody for coming out i hope to see you next week thanks for answering the evaluation questions we really appreciate that and keep in touch and stay safe and go wash your hands. Thanks a lot.